Thank you for the opportunity to share our work. Uh, today I'm presenting insights from an initiative to support rural producers and communities engage with commercial agriculture or as they are affected by it. Um, the initiative is called Empowering Producers for Commercial Agriculture, um, or rather Producers in Commercial Agriculture, EPIC, and it is supported by DFID. Uh, we are very grateful for that support. Uh, EPIC involves several colleagues and uh, partner organizations in Mali, uh, Malawi and Nepal. If you can show Oliver the first slide, you should see, be able to see the logos of our partners and their names, uh, which is great. Uh, two of my colleagues, Emily Pollack and Thierry Berger, are, are attending this webinar with me, and I'm hoping they might be able to contribute uh, to the discussion during the Q&A. Uh, next slide, please. So last year, I visited uh, Nepal's uh, mid-hills. Uh, agriculture is an important source of livelihoods there. Uh, informal trading remains the dominant route to market, uh, but there's a growing ag agribusiness industry that is looking to integrate into their supply chains. Uh, most of the farmers I spoke to grew maize, rice, vegetables. Uh, the soil is good, but the farmers raised uh, many different challenges they are grappling with. Uh, for example, a group of women told me that their plots were too small to make a living. Uh, they sold vegetables on the local market and uh, potatoes all the way in Katmandu. Each farmer sold to a trader. The farmers did not know the going market price, but they knew that the price in Kathmandu could be many times higher than the price they got from the traders. Uh, better, uh, an emergent farmer I, I, I met uh, was raising chickens, and he had just managed to rent in an additional five acres of prime land in the river. But he too had questions. He had questions about the security of his land rights and also the terms of his market access. Next slide, please. So this experience resonates with two issues that emerge from global trends. The first is that smallholders' involvement with commercial agriculture can take many different forms. Uh, public narratives often emphasize the place of formalized chains, often led by global agribusiness, and often uh, channeled by a structured arrangement such as contract farming. More formalized chains often reach, say, the top 10% of the better off, more commercially oriented farmers. For the vast majority of farmers, they rely on more informal uh, value chains of local traders and intermediaries. And also, they experience very diverse forms of user buyer agreement and value chain relations. So, the first point. The second first point um, is that the participation. Uh, uh, of smallholders in, dif this, in these different types of commercial culture does present opportunities, but also risks. Uh, gaining access to local, uh, national, regional, or even global markets to transform livelihoods, they can also expose farmers to exploitation. The, far the price that the farmers get for their produce may be too low them to be able to sustain their families, and many farmers become trapped in a spiral of debt. Rural communities also are socially differentiated, so the risks and opportunities are typically distributed unequally. For example, evidence from different parts of Africa shows that once land use shifts from food crops to cash crops, many women are deprived of the plots, uh, of the plots they used to control. So, uh, next slide, please. To uh, promote more equitable outcomes, uh, notions such as inclusive business uh, inform initiatives that link small scale farmers to markets. Uh, there are still questions, though, about what this inclusion means in practice for different types of agricultural value chains, from the more to the less formalized value chains, local to global. Businesses big and small uh, can include farmers but can, they can do so in a top-down way, or they can do it, or they can do it uh, under exploitative terms. The key question uh, ultimately is who decides about the terms of inclusion, and also uh, whether or not to participate in that decision in the first place. And it is this consideration that led us to explore the notion of agency. 
that is the ability of rural producers and of members of the wider communities to make informed choices uh, and then also to take effective action and ultimately to influence the realities around them. For example, whether or not to engage with a particular value chain and how to establish or influence the terms of their involvement. So these questions for us are particularly pressing because value chain actors will typically have different interests, quite often actually conflicting interests, and there are often substantial power imbalances between farmers and agribusinesses. Uh, and these power imbalances may be due, for example, uh, to differentiated access to information or to monopolistic or oligopolistic conditions whereby a few or even a single user controls process or controls the value chain. Under this condition, inclusion alone does not necessarily deliver hopeful benefits, and in fact, it can create risks. And this is clear from the mixed evidence on the outcomes of some types of producer buyer relations, such as contract farming. The literature points to some positive or many positive experiences, but also negative ones. The literature also points to uh, socially differentiated and gendered outcomes. But it's also clear from evidence at the macro level. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, namely data on how uh, value is shared within agricultural chains. This graph is taken uh, from an existing study uh, looking at the case of Canada, and it shows how farmers' net in, in green in this diagram has been uh, progressively squeezed over time the rising cost of inputs that farmers pay to their suppliers. For EPIC, looks to respond to these power imbalances and the recognition that inclusion alone, that the notion of inclusion alone is not enough. And our guiding question is this. If power imbalances flow from a combination of different factors, some structural, such as market power, some more conjunctural, such as access to information, is it possible to develop approaches that can reshape at least those factors that can be changed in the short term in ways that help rural producers have greater control over the value chain. Now, farmers use different strategies to approach value chains from a position of grit and strength. We are particularly interested in the extent to which legal rights, legal tools can provide an entry point for farmers to renegotiate the ways in which uh, markets affect their lives. Uh, next slide, please. So concretely, we are collaborating with partner organizations in Malawi and Nepal to develop legal empowerment approaches uh, uh, that support uh, not only rural producers but also members of the wider communities they're part of uh, in the context of commercial agriculture. And we're also working to feed lessons from this on the ground uh, testing of uh, approaches uh, to feed those lessons into law reform, both in the two countries but also beyond. So in Nepal, we are working with uh, CSRB uh, and, uh, uh, and NACCFL, uh, and they are supporting smallholders in three sites, reflecting different types of value chains, from the more informal to the more structured, uh, primarily in the vegetable sector. Whereas in Malawi, uh, we're collaborating with Walrec, and Walrec are supporting our growers and the wider community they are part of in the tea sector. Uh, so the emphasis is on the action, uh, but the initiative strong, uh, features a strong reflective dimension as well. We want to critically assess the extent to which these type of approaches can make a difference and under what conditions. Uh, next slide, please. So it is as part of this reflective approach that we've been uh, that EPIC also includes an international component centered on research, on lesson sharing events, on webinars, on blogs, and other outreach activities. And the issues I've discussed so far are some of the highlights that emerge from the research, a research report we published earlier this year. And one of the case studies we looked at has now been published as a separate, separate report. Both are available on our website. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so besides identifying the sort of problems that uh, the farmers grapple with, the issue of power imbalances in value chains and the issue they need to interrogate the notion of inclusion with regards to uh, inclusive business, we have also been taking stock of the experiences out there of what actors have been doing to try and challenge and redress those power imbalances. And we found that 
much of the work that is being done by many different actors out there globally can be grouped in three broad spheres of action. Of course, in practice, these spheres of action are overlapping and interlinked. The first, we call it understanding. So this is about rural actors acquiring information, for example, about their legal rights, also about data, and acquiring information through different channels, from radio broadcasts, to exchange visits, trainings, etc. Um, the second uh, type is organizing. Rural people develop organizations for collective action, uh, be economic organizations such as cooperatives and uh, aggregation mechanisms. It could be political, such as national federations of producers that advocate for policy change. And then the third sphere of action is about engaging, so it's harnessing the information, it's harnessing the organizational strength in order to engage with other actors, in order to change the realities around that the, that the farmers and the communities experience. This could involve, for example, Of advocating for policy reform, it could involve going to court to seek regress, redress, it could involve various things. And we found that legal empowerment approaches have been deployed uh, to support all these three areas of action. Uh, the slide here provides some examples, um, and in the next couple of slides, I'll also touch on two case studies uh, to illustrate this a little bit more. And I should say for clarity that the examples are cases we've documented, but they've been led by others who have had no in, in the implementation of the actual activities. So next slide, please. So the first example to illustrate the role of legal empowerment in the context of value chain relations, uh, primarily uh, documents or illustrates the dimension of engaging, what I called engaging, and it relates to the contract farming uh, arrangements that have been developed in the banana industry in the Philippines, and the fact that a group of growers, a number of farmers, deemed these arrangements to be unfair, and so they approached an organization called FarmCop, which is a grassroots organization that provides legal support for cultural cooperatives, the growers were seeking to renegotiate, uh, to obtain better terms. The companies initially resisted that, so there was a, a mobilization on the part of the farmers. There was also court action to try and get the contracts stra struck down. Ultimately, the contracts were renegotiated, leading to new arrangements that were more advantageous to the growers. So in this case, you see a combination of uh, collective action in the form of mobilization, the legal case, the actual renegotiation leading to some better outcomes in tangible terms. The second case, and uh, next slide please, i like to uh, mention, illustrate the type of approaches here, reflects a different combination of understanding, organizing and engaging uh, modes of working. And in here, the emphasis on constructive dialogue to promote constructive dialogue among value, value chain actors. The experience relates to a group of uh, green bean uh, farmers in Kenya. They were selling to an exporter. In turn, the exporter was selling to a retailer in the UK. Uh, and a group of farmers, but also workers in the farms and in the pack houses, approached two organizations, uh, the Kenya Human Rights Commission, which is an NGO in Kenya, and a UK based organization called Tradecraft Exchange, and they sought support from them. And essentially what the approach, what they interpreted here was a series of learning sessions at first, whereby the organizations provided the farmers with information about uh, the rights, but also how to engage value chain actors most effectively. But also very importantly, the organizations facilitated dialogue between the farmers, the workers, and the exporter, the retailer in the UK, and that provided an, an opportunity for value chain actors to better understand the uh, constraints, the challenges that the different actors were uh, facing, and ultimately develop collaborative solutions to the value chain problems that the farmers faced in particular, and also the, the workers. Uh, the result of that was that the growers could improve, improve their cultivation practices, the exporter agreed to set minimum prices in its contracts with the growers, the retailer uh, changed some of its trimming specifications, which resulted in the farmers getting paid more indirectly. And as a result of these arrangements, the farmer experienced not only higher, but also more predictable, 
predictable incomes, and also a sense of greater voice, a greater control over the value chain. So next slide, please. So a couple of experiences uh, uh, which others show that it is possible under some conditions at least to make some advances and that the avenues for that can be very different depending of course on the issues, depending on the context. That said, it's for us and for EPIC very early days. Uh, this applies uh, to the work in Malawi, but also the work in, in, in Nepal, and more generally to the efforts that we'll be making to frame the issues, review the evidence, share the lessons, inform our own work in the two countries and also uh, uh, beyond. So we recognize the complexity of the issues, the difficult challenges involved, uh, the fundamental structural factors that are at play that are very difficult to shift. Uh, through legal empowerment uh, approaches alone, uh, and we aim to revisit this framework that we've developed for the implementation of the project. Uh, so for us, this has uh, been an opportunity, this initial stock taking of the evidence has been an opportunity for us to develop the concepts that will guide our action, we recognize the limitations, we recognize the challenges, we want to revisit this concepts as we move forward with implementation and treat the whole experience as an ongoing learning process. So in that vein, we'll be very grateful for any feedback, uh, comments on the approach, but also suggestions about practical experiences that participants may have had or they may be aware of, uh, case studies that we could document and share. So any, any uh, not only questions, but also comments and suggestions and pointers would be very welcome during the discussion. Thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing from you. I would like to remind everyone that you can uh, directly ask your questions or you can also post them on the chat box. I think everyone has been using that. So please feel free to post your question, either ask them directly or post them here on the chat box. <clears throat> um, Maybe I can start uh, kicking off this session with a question that I've prepared. Lorenzo? Hello, Lorenzo, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, so based on the currently available empirical data from, from the studies uh, and the project, uh, what kind of socioeconomic conditions that are favorable to stay in bottom-up arrangement for social uh, legal empowerment for the rural agency in the long run? Lorenzo, don't uh, mute your um, speaker, yeah, or your your um, microphone. Can you hear me? I I I, I should have been muted. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yes, now now you yes. can. Okay, yeah, but just to thank you for that question, which which is obviously very broad, and the answer to that would be potentially. Uh, vast and also the conditions, of course, vary considerably depending on the situation. But what we find, uh, what we've found, uh, at least one lesson, one insight we've gained so far is that the three spheres of action that we have isolated, identified for analytical purposes, the understanding, so awareness raising, information, you know, the sort of capacity building type work, the organizational work, strengthening organizations, getting better organized, etc., and then engaging in the most effective way, of course, in practice, are all interlinked, and it's very difficult to isolate these. Uh, so the, 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 the experiences that, and in both cases, I've, uh, in, that I've used to illustrate, in fact, rely on a combination of, of these. So the awareness raising uh, is only uh, likely to go so far, it needs to be complemented by other activities. Um, the other thing to say is that in this work, we've been talking about socio-legal empowerment. We recognize that the legal aspect is not enough. You can have, you can be a little bit more aware of your rights. You can be a bit of, uh, more aware of what the law requires and provides for what the contracts should say. But really, in this type of complex value chain relation, 
illegal is only a part and often in fact a small one the and the functioning of the value chain, the business relations, uh, economic uh, uh, dimensions as well. So the combination of different modes of activity, which have now isolated for analyt for simplicity and analytical purposes, they need to look at the overall package of approaches and 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 uh, and, in, in, and, and uh, activities is is uh, what we think um, is is helpful and what we're trying to pursue through the activities in in the two countries. Okay. Great, thanks. Um, and I also have a question from Tina Hubio chat box. Uh, the question is, um, I would like to ask if farmers feels always comfortable with the legal contract. I think it's a it's a very good question, and um, it's again a difficult one to answer, partly because farmers are of course a very very uh, differentiated group. Uh, and so there may very well be um, uh, the more commercially oriented farmers who may be uh, cultivating somewhat larger areas of land, or in fact, they may be uh, expanding their uh, land and their cultivation to rent new land to neighbors and other community members or to other arrangements. And they may be uh, more at ease with the sort of formalized arrangements through legal contracts, be it a contract farming type arrangement, maybe more in getting, in getting uh, documentary evidence for the land, uh, they, 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 etc. But then there may be a lot of uh, other farmers who are not necessarily aspiring to be great or wouldn't necessarily be able to be in Included in that sort of formalized uh, contractual uh, arrangements and are rather um, uh, more comfortable and potentially even better off uh, pursuing opportunities in the value chain that are more localized and it's more about then relationship that with the uh, local traders, the intermediaries. And one question that we've been exploring, I started exploring, uh, and particularly my colleague uh, Emily. Emily Pollack is in that sort of more informal setting. What would legal empowerment uh, approaches look like? What sort of legal empowerment approaches look like? So you're not necessarily looking at formalizing contracts or even formalizing a cooperative, but rather catering for the needs of those uh, poorer, more marginalized farmers who are not into that sort of um, uh, arrangement or logic. Could I could I comment on this? Um... This is Tina Hovia. Yes, please. It's just two cases that I've lived through. One in Mali, where the farmers established a, a formal contract with um, a mill, a processing plant, but then they sold the, the grains to somebody who came earlier, and they had kind of un difficulties understanding the commitment made with the with the contract. So there are different ways of seeing this. And then, for example, in Zanzibar, when we were trying to establish legal contracts between vegetable traders or hotels and the farmers, and the the buyers or traders didn't want to have that, they 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 felt that it, it's too restrictive and and they disturbed the the existing balance with society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, can I respond, Octavio? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, thank you for sharing those uh, cases, uh, Tina, which they which resonate uh, strongly. The first uh, to, uh, speaks to the issue of site selling, which is a common problem in contract farming arrangements. And, uh, and uh, from a buyer's perspective, there are different types of responses to that. And some of them traditionally have emphasized the sort of sanction aspect of the contract. We want a legal contract because it's enforceable and if you breach it, you're in trouble. In practice, it's very difficult to enforce contracts, particularly at a very small scale and a very diffuse scale. So there are other approaches that are emerging that look at incentive-based contract farming, whereby they're trying to create incentives for the farmers not to site sell. Um, but I think uh, particularly the second case you mentioned uh, raises a, a more general question, which is quite often there, there's, a, there's an instinctive 
uh, assumption that uh, what needs to be done in order to include farmers in value chain is to integrate them to contract farming arrangements. And what we're finding through our collaboration with partners, particularly in Nepal, is that the farmers and their organizations may be more in, may be less interested in being integrated in that way, we see it as being controlled by the buyer. Uh, the contract effectively is determined by the buyer and the power lies with the buyer. And they're more interested in exploring ways for them to establish some level of control over the downstream section of the value chain, particularly if you're talking about local national markets that you can actually have uh, you know, their own stalls or you know, a cooperative to run a retail facility in, in Kathmandu, for example. Uh, so looking at access to market, not by the buyer integrating the uh, the contra farm, the producers getting control of the market inside of the, of, the, of the value chain. And I think it's obviously very difficult to do that at scale, but I think it's definitely worth exploring that avenue as well. Is there any other question or yes. um, uh, Tina? I have, yeah, sure. Yes, my name is Alain from Enable in Belgium. Yes, mm -hmm. Alain. Yes. Uh, f first of all, I, I want to thank uh, Lorenzo for his presentation. And uh, I was very interested by uh, the, the steps he presents for the social legal empowerment, the understanding, engaging and uh, uh, organizing uh, because we are as a bilateral agency, we are uh, engaged in several countries in Africa in agricultural value chains and that's what we try to do with uh, small scale producer and uh, uh, organization of producer. But uh, it's very interesting to have a kind of first uh, methodological approach that could be very useful for us in the future when we try to uh, to design our uh, intervention. And uh, I have maybe two questions. The first of is about inclusion, because several times we started from the the point that uh, inclusion is necessarily positive and uh, uh, many many times it's a win-win situation but but you stress that it's not necessarily the case and could you a little bit explain what are maybe the trade-off the negative aspect of the concept of inclusion and the second question is when we started the preparation of uh, an intervention in, uh, for a small-scale producer, what are the, the condition or the starting point or the question what, that we, we need to, to ask us uh, when we try to design the intervention at the beginning? Thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you for that question, Alan, uh, and comments as well. Um, so, um, it, with regards to the notion of inclusion, um, semantically, in English at least, inclusion tends to have a connotation, and it's obviously been used in a, in a positive sense in terms of uh, inclusive business, and also in terms of looking at the opportunities that can be created by opening up new avenues to markets uh, for, for small-scale producers. Um, and I think I, uh, I, I don't have a problem with that, but I think what we're saying is that inclusion alone can happen under many terms. You can have terms of inclusion that are very difficult or even disadvantageous for the farmers. Uh, you can have uh, private arrangements that are such that the, the farmers get a low price for the produce they buy, pay a high price for the uh, inputs they, um, uh, they uh, source from, from their uh, suppliers. And the result of that combination of low, low prices for the 
produce high prices for the inputs, then the farmers end up being low spiral of debt. And I think you find that very often in uh, in various types of uh, contractual arrangements uh, that particularly um, uh, for longer term crops where uh, the income only starts materializing after a number of years. Um, so, so inclusion can be good, but it depends on the terms of inclusion. Uh, and, mm. and they need to be looked at very carefully. There shouldn't be an assumption that the fact alone that farmers are uh, accessing a market is, is good for them. They may have, you know, there are issues of opportunity costs of different markets. They may be pursued, could be low, global markets, but it may be they may be better off with markets at the local level and national mm. uh, domestic demand and all that. In terms of the future, sort of the trade-offs that there are with other options, but also, and this is where the notion of agency comes in, comes in, is that very often there is a, a sense in some of the narratives that you know what, what one needs to do is to bring producers into the market as if it was sort of passive, you know, passive beneficiary, effectively of a developing intervention. I think what we want to emphasize is that ability of farmers and their communities ultimately to make up their own minds as to, as to whether they want to be um, mm -hmm. uh, involved with that value chain and also to shape the terms of that involvement, not just a passive exercise, uh, uh, even if it could be beneficial, but rather it's in an, a, a, an experience where they have more control over what's, what's happening. Uh, and that's where the notion of agency is a useful complement to that entry on inclusion. No, thank you. Um, if there's no direct questions, I'm going to read some questions from the chat box. One from uh, Manuel Urrutia. Uh, Once a new set of policy supporting rural producers in value chains is adopted, what role do social legal empowerment organizations or in institutions play in implementing them? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's a it's an important uh, question uh, insofar as um, particularly from a socio legal empowerment uh, perspective, um, a lot more uh, can be achieved if the legal framework, if the policy framework is is enabling, is is conducive, and so if there is a progressive uh, legal text secures the land rights of small scale producers so that they're in a better they are in a position of greater strength when it comes to dealing with companies and governments uh, if there is a legal framework that uh, secures their the protects their, in some cases that protects the rights of uh, contract farmers as well um, so when there is a, a progressive or an enabling legal environment then there is also greater scope for uh, social legal approaches that essentially raise awareness, uh, strengthen the uh, 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 ability of people to exercise those rights in practice. So I see uh, a, you know, the implementation phase is, is obviously the implementation of um, uh, progressive legislation is an important part of this. We think that there is also an important dimension that goes beyond the implementation of existing law that also looks at strengthening voice in the context of policy reform, of law reform, and we've seen that in a number of experiences across the globe where um, some of the more collective action structures, organizations of more of a political nature that are advocating for policy change, that they actually can uh, make a difference um, in having farmers' voices heard. So that sort of lawmaking aspect and participation in law reform, we see that also as being an important part of legal empowerment. Thank you, Lorenzo. There's also another question. A, a, there seems to be another two, one question. Yeah, two more questions. Yeah, if there's no direct question, I'm going to keep reading on them. Yeah. Uh, so one from, how do you ensure that uh, social legal empowerment approaches do not exhaust users' limited resources in terms of time, labor, and finance uh, to conduct their production and either other livelihood activities? 
Yeah, I mean, again, a, a very good question, and I guess a question that interrogates very much all of the participatory approaches to development, right? Where do you strike the balance? Uh, and I think ultimately um, the, the the way uh, I see it is the question is whether an approach can really add value to the problems that the farmers are grappling with. So if you know if 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 what you're talking about is a separate initiative that sort of you know is an additional set of meetings and people show up and discuss but doesn't really help very much with the practical challenges then it does create that problem of you know this is just a waste of time I'm so busy with uh, so many other things I need to do. But if the farmers are actually grappling with a specific problem, for example, they're trying to uh, uh, consolidate, renegotiate, revise a relationship with the buyer, um, and the activity that, uh, that actually supports them in achieving that, then um, what we see out there, and what we are hoping to see in our own uh, activities with partners in Nepal and, and Malawi, is that part, uh, the farmers are interested because it's a good investment in time and effort. If it stops being that, then it, it shouldn't really, it shouldn't really um, continue. It doesn't really add value. Uh, all right, that's great. And um, but this one here is not a question, but it's mostly a comment on the the word of inclusive. So here it says uh, reads that there's also a question of who is getting included. Does everybody get included, including women and more uh, vulnerable actors? Yeah. So again, I mean, Thierry is a, a co-author and, and a colleague, uh, so he's a co-author of the report and is, uh, uh, I guess this is also a comment that partly is a question that was raised earlier about the issue of inclusion uh, and, uh, so, you know, when talking about inclusion and inclusive business, how do we make sure that we're not eliding important questions such as, you know, who is being included here and, and in particular, given the very significant differentiation that exists in rural areas, some of which I alluded to both in the practical experience from Nepal I started with, but also more generally in the presentation. And so including uh, including some, uh, the more pro pro the more the better of the more commercial oriented farmers doesn't necessarily include others. It could be lower income groups, it could be women, it could be um, ethnically marginalized groups and, and other, and in fact, uh, the inclusion of some uh, can have impacts, both positive and negative, on, on those who are not included. Uh, so it could be that some people find employment as uh, farm workers and small-scale farms, etc., but the negative may have to do with uh, pressures on the land, on the water, pollution from pests. Sides, etc. And I guess you know when we look at this sort of uh, these optics of inclusion and inclusive business, it's also asking this question of who's being included and who is not, and what happens not, and how do we uh, uh, how do we ad address those issues in the perspective of agency, not just of the farmers who are included, who participate in the value chain, but also those who are not. Uh, we think sort of takes. Uh, recognizes that, that differentiation, that diversity, and also uh, casts a slightly different perspective on the, on the issue. All right. The next question is uh, basically trying to connect the social empowerment with the climate change uh, mitigations and adaptation efforts. So it reads, uh, considering the tremendous impact, sorry, it's from Laura Barrington. Uh, Questions reads, considering the impact of climate change on rural livelihood, how should the social legal empowerment, which mainly consists of political and business support, be harmonized with climate change adaptation and mitigation efforts? Do you have any recommendations to the government and development partners? Yeah. Um, yes, I, 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 I think uh, we, we do need to discuss this issue of climate change, given the importance uh, it has and how it affects us all, and including this issue. And I can see how the interface between climate change and the theme I just discussed is quite 
complex and uh, presents multiple dimensions. You can, one, on the one hand, one could argue that uh, empowered uh, producers, empowered communities who are more in control of their own livelihoods, including when it comes to their involvement uh, with commercial, uh, with the cultural value chains, makes for more resilient uh, communities as well, depending on the sort of agriculture they opt for, but it can pave the way to more resilient um, uh, 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 pathways for agricultural development. You can also see that how there can be some tensions here. So one of the examples I mentioned is the is the example of the green beans uh, from uh, the farmers uh, growing green beans in Kenya, ultimately exporting to the UK. There was a discussion about that even yesterday on on social media um, around the fact that, of course, you know, expo you know, exporting green beans all the way to the UK does raise questions from a from a climate change perspective, from a climate change mitigation uh, perspective, whether that is uh, you know sort of investing in uh, supporting farmers, supporting workers in a value chain like that, that is fully consistent with efforts to tackle climate change. So I can see both um, uh, 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 mutual reinforcement between this sort of approach um, and, and, and a sort of climate change uh, adaptation, climate change mitigation, but I can also see some tension, some dilemmas that can arise when social legal empowerment or agency issues are being looked at in relation to value chains that inherently raise some of these issues. Um, so I'm not sure whether that sort of translates into the sale into recommendations, but clearly the issue of climate change needs to be factored into uh, this, uh, this uh, problematic more fully than it has been so far. And the problematic of inclusive business, of linking smallholders to markets, the open distant markets, looking at resilience and resilient forms of agriculture and agricultural production then using social legal empowerment as a way to support that and, and, and facilitate its implementation rather than uh, sort of entering in tension or conflict with goals. There's also uh, another comment from Tina Juvio. Climate considerations often requires a longer term perspective some cases can be contrary to farmers' everyday needs. They need to reflect how climate actions could be compensated either through value as premiums or other compensation mechanisms. Do you have anything to add to that, Lorenzo? No, I think it's an important, it's a very good reflection, and um, and I and I agree on the need to reflect uh, on on these issues. All right, I am going for the next questions on the chat box. Is it, it is understood that it takes time to build producer agency. Can you provide some indication about how much time is it required? How long are the processes that we're thinking about? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, again, uh, an important issue, the time dimension. Um, which uh, does raise many issues, both because very often the farmers are grappling with immediate uh, problems and because a lot of the support that is provided uh, in this mode is uh, channeled through development projects that have their own time constraints quite often uh, shorter than the sort of time horizon that would be needed in order to uh, sustain uh, agency uh, over time. Um, I, it, the, what I would say is that yes, it's it, it's um, it's easy to underestimate just how much time it takes to build uh, these um, uh, these experiences. So another case we looked at in uh, our research report uh, considered the experience of cocoa growers in in Ghana and how a, a cooperative uh, of growers over time managed to acquire greater control over the value chain or at least a segment of the value chain to the point that they're now essentially controlling a, a avenue for exporting uh, and uh, uh, producing chocolate in, in the UK. Um, in, in an experience like that, you look at a very, very long time horizon where so many interventions happened over time and a 
consolidated and an experience that has then uh, uh, become established and then expanded over time. So you can see how the time horizon can be long. Um, I think also one thing to say is that one has to be realistic when we look, we're looking at uh, for example, in Malawi, where to focus our efforts, we ended up focusing uh, together with our partners, Walrec, we're focusing on a particular site and a particular value chain team, but we're exploring other value chains at the beginning. And in some of the value chains, the, the mark, the structure of the market uh, arrangements, the market power, the consolidation upstream and downstream of farming is such that it's going to be very, very difficult, even over a long period of time, to fundamentally um, shift uh, reality uh, through a legal empowerment approach alone. Um, so there needs to be something else which is uh, beyond the control of our own projects, uh, uh, to, to be honest. And so it's not only an issue of time, uh, which is quite often long term, but also having a very clear understanding of what can realistically be achieved under what conditions and realizing that in some cases, Structure force, the structural factors are so pressing, the only oligopolistic conditions upstream and downstream make it very difficult to actually challenge that through a legal approach. Um, yeah. Thank you, Lorenzo, for your response. And uh, I think just to add into that, there's a comment from Tina Puvio from Food and Forest Development Finland. Uh, this is regarding uh, the value of the approach. So the value of social legal approach is largely determined by a degree with the law enforcement and who can count on it. Here. Um... I see where that woman comes from, uh, in the sense that, as as discussed, uh, if if part of the action relies on being more aware of the law, of the rights, uh, mobilizing around that, even in the case of the mentioned, even actually going to court, seeking a renegotiation of contracts, clearly the legal framework matters, and therefore, in a sense, a lot depends on what what that legal framework is, and so in a sense, it's determined by the legislation, by the by the by the by the ex, extent to which enforcement arrangements are in place, that legislation to uh, actually have a place. In practice, uh, there are also other dimensions, and in particular, I've sort of tried to emphasize the, the organizing, mobilizing dimensions of this as well. So it's 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 it, legal enforcement, legal compliance is a part of it. Uh, but really, ultimately, it's about the strength of the organizations uh, and uh, whether it's a cooperative or a set of cooperatives, an alliance of cooperatives, uh, so an economically or business-oriented type organization, or whether it's more of a political advocacy type of organizational platform. A lot depends on the sort of organizational uh, strength, the uh, type of mobilization that in a sense, the legal, the social legal empowerment emphasis is not meant to pay only this is about law enforcement. Also, because in the realities of, of many experienced by many smallholders uh, 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 all over the world, but particularly the, the ones that are growing, uh, creating small plots of land, very inaccessible uh, courts with uh, very limited awareness of the legal framework, uh, very little implementation of what the law says in rural areas, just relying on that formal aspect of the law, as it were, it just seems so remote from the from the reality that the farmers experience on an everyday life. So I agree with the comment, but I would also add this sort of, you know, this sort of looking at social, uh, slightly broader set of interventions that is not just about the law as such, about um, collective action, is about organization of strength, is about mobilization, uh, is about politically savvy uh, interventions. All right. I also have an incoming comment from Thierry Berger, yeah, we call it from the IIED, uh, just to add on to the, the questions on the temporal scale of, of the approach. 
uh, here he says it does take time to build agency once it has built one it needs to make sure intervention will be sustained even after projects have ended yeah i would agree with that yeah uh, and I also have a comment, uh, sorry, question from Tina Huvio again. Uh, Des Lorenzo, do you have experience of cases when a producer agency has lost their position to defend the member's interest, for example, by a light cap or bad governance? Uh, yes, there are, uh, there are many experiences out there where, um, where, uh, uh, the action didn't necessarily deliver the benefits he was trying to uh, pursue, and that may have may be linked to um, uh, just the external factors around the power imbalances at play, or the fact that the courts dismissed the case, or the renegotiation didn't pan out as they hoped. <laughs> But it also has to do sometimes with internal factors around the way in which the community or the producers are organized, or who is representing whom, and what communication channels uh, exist to make, to ensure the downward accountability of leaders or the representatives to their constituents. Perhaps also, it's not necessarily, you know, there are some good experiences and bad experiences to, yeah, in a sense that that's that's true, but yes, in every experience presents both uh, achievements or advances uh, and uh, challenges as well. And particularly when we look at that issue of protracted period of time it takes to develop these experiences and bring them to fruition, uh, that you can see how you know you've got you know there's a, a, an advance that is then followed by some you know some issue that comes up and that issue may have to do uh, with the way in which their governance structure is operating or not operating very well, the accountability within that governance structure, and so even successful in quotes uh, cases. Um, if one looks at the literature carefully, even the successful cases also present those challenges of uh, elite capture and governance challenges and how to uh, deal with them, how to address them on an ongoing basis. And I think that also ties with the point that you made about the need to sustain the, the, the approach, the action. It's not just a project, a one-off contribution that make, can make a difference. It's, you know, it's that long-term effect in a prolonged period of time that can or sense of um, what can be achieved and what can be then, how can those achievements be sustained over time? Great, thank you so much, Lorenzo. Uh, do we have any other questions? Don't have anything right now in the chat box. I, I have maybe another one. Uh, it's Alan speaking. Uh, I read in the document that social legal empowerment the, does not mean to restrict only to uh, value chain approach and uh, specifically to to secure more better condition in monetary terms, but uh, it means also to to enhance the capacity and capabilities of uh, rural actors uh, to develop their own vision uh, for uh, a bilateral agency. What does it mean concretely? Because to enhance their own vision to a more endogenous vision of development, it's a very wide approach and it meets a lot of efforts and a lot of time does it mean that uh, agricultural value chain is the entry point to tackle a more a broader perspective on development on the local side uh yes i i mean i think there are some dilemmas here and i recognize that some of these challenges are very broad uh, difficult very often to tackle for one agency alone. Um, I suppose one issue, to, one way to look at this is also about entry points. 
uh, in some of the interventions, the entry point is there is a global buyer uh, that is active there, and then the question is, let's see how we can with more small supply chain. And of course, if that's the entry point, a lot of the choices have already been made with regards to the options that the small that we have and the um, and the uh, to, to a large extent also the terms of that inclusion because the because of the way that value chain relations out. Uh, so then the question is, can there be a different entry point that is more looking at the uh, at that particular group of producers in that area and the sort of options they have, the alternative options they have, mm -hmm. alternative land use options being different crops, different value chains they could get involved with, whether they um, they are better off uh, supplying local markets. You know, in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, of course, because of the growing um, urbanization, growing demand from towns, there is actually a, a significant uh, demand for produce uh, from, from local towns. Uh, so by taking a slightly different entry point, all of a sudden it becomes uh, possible to explore options and trade-offs and opportunity costs between those different options that wouldn't be quite as visible if the entry point is, you know, a given value chain or even a given company that is active in that value chain. Um, so I recognize that, you know, in a sense, this could be a very broad uh, agenda. At the same time, it can also be distilled more specifically around the entry point that is used to design an intervention. And we've seen that in, 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 uh, in different projects. And we, have a cell, we ourselves grappled with that in both Malawi and, and Nepal, you know, on how, how to identify the value chains to, 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 focus, to focus on. There was also another question, I think, in the chat box. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. I'm afraid that this uh, is the last questions, but we are we also welcome uh, any other question, and we can follow up on that after the session. Uh, this one here from uh, Tina, who is also representing the Agri Court. Uh, the question is: Do you feel that there can be trade-offs between wide inclusion and commercial success? Well, in a sense, there there are there are tensions there, and there are potentially different objectives, and this is partly linked to the social differentiation that exists in rural areas, which I mentioned. So, if if uh, you know, in a sense, it be from a commercial, uh, from the po point of view of a commercial operator, it may be easier, more straightforward to include. Uh, as it were, the top 10% of commercially minded farmers. Um, uh, the, the more commercially minded farmers, uh, but that will lead to outcomes that will be very different from, say, the outcomes of an intervention that is more focused on uh, supporting the poorer and more marginalized groups among that uh, rural community. So in Nepal, for example, the work that we're uh, developing together with CSRC and NACCFL has a strong emphasis also on reaching that group for example, the landless farmers who are currently cultivating land based on rental arrangements. How can they be in a better position to also engage with commercial agriculture, perhaps the more informal value chains, the more local markets? So yes, in, you know, there are different there are tensions between different objectives, and these different objectives are linked to uh, different groups, uh, the different priorities that an intervention can have in terms of reaching different parts of the rural world. Uh, and so there are trade-offs, and I think it is it is important to um, uh, to think through what an intervention is really trying to achieve, whether it's trying to uh, um, develop a commercially oriented venture with those farmers who are already involved in the business, yeah, or whether it's trying to strengthen the livelihood options of the poorer and more marginalized farmers. And the two interventions will likely look very different. 